Yet again, we're jumping into the profound finish of Star Trip Starship Legend. This time, we should take a gander at the center class starship, or rather the center type. Regardless, the U.S. Center's brief appearance in the Ed Time to Stand episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine made this particular ship design famous. A gem Hadar attack ship under Captain Benjamin Sisko's command, who was on a covert mission for Starfleet Command, was mistakenly hit by the ship. We'll cover this in more detail later on in the video. Strangely, the Centaur class has been chosen as the hero ship in the brand new video game, Star Trek Resurgence. Not a universe class, not a sovereign class. No, this game is going with a Centaur. Subsequently, the US Fearless is presently the legend boat of the game, and it looks fabulous. Due to Star Trek, the next generation, the design is very similar to what we are accustomed to. As a result, fans of the next generation and ships of this kind are in for a real treat. Welcome to Trip Focal. Let's get started, Captain Jack, as your host. I'm stepping in for Lieutenant Adam today, so you must tolerate me. Yet, before we wrap into this video, if you mean to stay up with the latest on all the most recent Star Trip news, legend, from there, the sky is the limit. Then, at that point, make a point to hit that buy-in button to never miss a video from my group here at Journey Focal. You can also get daily updates on the Star Trek universe by following us on social media. However, as always, please share your thoughts with us in the following comment section. Since, supposing that you're discussing Star Journey, then, at that point, we need to find out about it. Okay, take part. Interestingly, the Starfleet Design Center class only featured a source section linked to a small secondary weapons pod. This was basically the same as the Walker class plan, a mid-23rd century plan. The bow would be created by idealistic Planitia Armada Yards in the Sol framework on Mars at the high-level Starship Plan Agency, Mix Office. The Centaur class would eventually reach 210 meters in length. She was predominantly this long because of some extremely lengthy nacelle, which plan-wise were basically acquired from an Excelsior-class starship. Size-wise, the boat could oblige 315 officials and group. The Centa class could travel at a maximum warped speed of warp 7, in terms of speed. It matched the twisted speed of a Pearl Hadar warrior class. The ship would be able to reach warped 9.6 in later design, most likely after the Dominion War. The source segment of the Centa class was, plan-wise, practically indistinguishable from the Excelsior class source area, yet was somewhat more modest. They probably just shortened the Excelsior's design to fit the Miranda weapons pod without making it look too out of scale. The bridge module, on the other hand, resembled the starships of the Miranda class and was most likely a Miranda-class bridge module that had been incorporated into this new ship design. Curiously for the Senta class, the shelter straight for transport create and other helper vessels was not situated at the back of the vessel, yet at the same the front. On the top of the source section, the shuttle bay faced forward. Extremely strange for Starfleet starships, yet hello, it's useful. The Senta class used a small secondary weapons pod to house two torpedo launches as a weapon. This kitbash starship was an excellent choice for the Dominion War because it carried nine Type 9 phaser emitters. The weapon crew was straightforwardly a similar weapon crew found on Miranda-class starships, recently rearranged. This was an in-universe payoff transport. Additionally, the vessel would have numerous sensor arrays, copper-colored sensor pallets behind the bridge module, and a sensor dome on the source section's bottom that housed the sensitive long-range scanning equipment. Because of this, it was ideal for border patrol missions, particularly during the Dominion War, when it served as a first line of defense against Dominion forces and provided early warning. Some of these ships would get a secondary hold designed more in line with Starfleet standards after the Dominion War, replacing the weapons pod. The optional structure would contain a red erector dish and your standard Starfleet MacGuffins. The center class, like a few of Starfleet's quick designs, was made to deal with Starfleet's huge losses in the beginning of the Dominion War. To make up for the losses, Starfleet had to accelerate shipbuilding projects. In an effort to prevent Dominion forces from further advancing into Federation space, the Seventh Fleet was sent to the Tyro system. Starfleet's counteroffensive was a complete failure, only 14 of the 112 ships in the There were few resources available. In this manner, plan compromises must be made. All of this took place when ships were built from partial builds. The utilization of rescue parts and twisted motors were placed into new development also. 
As a consequence of this expedited assembly procedure, both the center class and the U.S. center itself were produced. It also provides an explanation for the ship's hybrid appearance. Okay, we will discuss the center. The most well-known center class ship was the U.S. Resolute before it appeared in Star Trek, Surgeons. The U.S. Center was given the mission of Border Patrol in 2374, and Captain Charlie Reynolds was in charge of it. It would attack the Gem Header attack ship, which was commanded by Captain Benjamin Sisko. Under the wear of who was ready and what they were doing. Fortunately for Sisko and for purpose of the mission, three Diamond Hadar ships showed up and pursued off the Center. Fortunately for the Center's group, the boat appeared to surpass them and endure the experience. During one of the numerous cover missions, as Cardus and Elon Garrick later mentioned, Garrick claimed to have been taken prisoner by the center and held aboard a shuttlecraft from the ship. After these occurrences, the center would also participate in Operation Return a few weeks later. The U.S. center was still working for Starfleet in 2384. In 2384, the ship was part of a fleet sent by the Federation to stop the U.S. protostar. Sadly, as the greater part of the Armada, the boat was tainted by a weapon known as the Living Build, which assumed control over the Starfleet sends and made them shoot upon themselves. The convey appears to take some harm by cordial period of fire. However, the ship's current location is unknown to us. It probably didn't get much damage, so it probably could have been saved and fixed later. The U.S. unflinching NCC-92317 was a Centaur-class starship during the 2370s and 2380s, the starship was worked during the Domain War and would serve in the conflict like numerous center-class starships. However, by 2380, it was still in use as a science vessel on the edge of Federation space after the war. Captain Zachary Solano and the U.S. Resolute were sent to the Tyrellian border region in 2380 by Starfleet, where Dr. Leah Barnes was probably taken by the Terranians. Dr. Leah Browns was not actually captured by the Terranians, Rather, she was forced to work on a warp core design that was more volatile, which Starfleet and the Federation were slowing down for safety reasons. Dr. Browns planned a twist center and essentially coordinated it into the Undaunted, making it a brilliant proving ground for Dr. Brown's freshest plan. Dr. Browns would complete her work by activating the warped core prototype, and the determined would be captured by the Terrani. In any case, this would make huge harm the boat while enacted, starting a twisted center break. The observer transport at that point, Leader Sutherland, would isolate the source segment of the unflinching from its optional body and pilot the auxiliary frame into a Telranian warship, saving his Starfleet group at the expense of his own life. Fortunately, a now highly ranked member of the Teutonian military, General Endar, who was first seen in the next generation, would ensure that the destruction of a Teutonian warship would not result in war between the Teutons and the Federation. If you bend the lines, Starfleet would also classify this mission and claim that the ship was damaged and lost crew members during a planned test of a new warped core design. I'm taking a gander at you, yoga class. If you want to hear Lt. Adam riff on some really bizarre ship designs and learn more about these kinds of starships, you should go and watch out. Features isn't that so. The Centaur class was ultimately kit-bombed from the source section, and the critics of two U.S. Excelsior models were distorted. The U.S. Reliance Torpedo Robar and Bridge Miranda class were utilized in the design of the ship. Originator Adam Buckner made the Centaur class utilizing the parts from the boats. He thought they would get along well. However, Adam never anticipated that the design would be filmed, so there was no room for eternal light and the ship's registry was only paper in the early designs. Very neat. Buckner was one of the VFX supervisors on Star Trek, Deep Space Nine. The Centaur Clouds were born as a result of Buckner receiving free time from his boss, Gary Hudson, who informed him that they required additional ships that they could utilize. The dying art of motion control models was something Hustle wanted to teach Buckner. As a result, they spent a lot of time in the modeling shop. He was least prepared for the Centaur's design to appear on screen.